Hi again, everybody. Welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio. And a big thank you again to all of you who have been watching all these videos that I've been posting. People who are connected to the Beatles or who do work on the Beatles, authors, fellow podcasters. Um, I'm having so much fun doing this. And um, if you have friends that are Beatle fans, tell them about this channel and please get them to subscribe. On my show today is someone who should not be a stranger to you. Um, he has a very popular uh, YouTube channel, Mean Mr. Mayo, and he's about to celebrate his ninth anniversary on YouTube with the channel. Congratulations for that. And uh, he is also a fellow co-host of mine on the Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, which airs every other Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern on Facebook. And it's it's heard on every platform and watched on YouTube as well. And that's Joe Mayo. Hi, Joe. Hello, Ken. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's great to be here. Before we get to our main uh, concept for the show, and this is the premiere of something new called the Fab Five, why don't you tell the folks a little bit about your channel, all the things that you've done. I know you, you cover so much about pop culture and you've done quite a lot on the Beatles, including something relatively new called Fab Gab. So you want to just say a yeah. few words about that? Yeah, well, um, it's going to be nine years, like you were saying, uh, that I've been doing this, but it started out primarily just because I got back into vinyl collecting and uh, did it as a vinyl collector's thing where a lot of people on YouTube show their acquisitions, new things they've got, talk about records and it was basically like like that, but because the Beatles are my all time favorite, and I, I'm a Beatleholic and solo Beatleholic, hmm. uh, I decided to call myself Mean Mr. Mayo. I was looking for a title that had something to do with the Beatles. I, you know, I didn't want to do the obvious like Father Mackenzie or Uncle Albert or something. They were probably hmm. taken anyway, so I went with that. And then, uh, besides just showing records and things like that, I started. Uh, making record store visit videos or hanging out at my store where a lot of people seem, they seem to like that a lot. Uh, sometimes uh, reviews of this and that, and I try to keep up with news and, be, you know, Beatle content primarily, not exclusively, but 98% maybe mm -hmm. uh, Beatles yeah. and solo Beatles stuff. And it's a great time. I've met a lot of people. Uh, it's so good to communicate with everybody and uh, make friends and, when I go to the Fest for Beatles fans, which hasn't been for a couple of years, hopefully we're going to make it. Hmm. It's so good to meet people out there that recognize me from the channel and you could make new buddies that way. And I, I really love it. Yeah. I mean, you see their names all the time in the comments and then to see them face to face. Yeah, you know, it's, it's great. It's, yeah, it sure is. Tell the folks about Fab Gab. Yeah, Fab Gab, yeah, which you mentioned. I just started that um, a couple of months ago. I was looking for like a, a kind of show, Beatles-oriented show, that I'm going to be doing with my friend Matthew Street. He, he has his name from the famous Liverpool uh, Street. Mm -hmm, sure. And um, he's my, my uh, partner on the show. And uh, we, start, we started out by doing ranking shows where we just talk about the Beatles albums and rank our least favorite to most favorite songs, which is hard to do and sometimes ridiculously so to even attempt it. They're all great. So what, how do you like, what's the difference between like a, the 12th song and the 13th and so on. But we thought we'd do all the solo albums gradually over a period of years, I suppose. And eventually we're going to be doing other topics, not just rankings. We're going to, we're going to be doing different subjects. We know we want to do a show together defending the U S Beatles albums, the Capitol uh -huh. albums and the United United Artists, Hard Day's Night. And that, for example, is one of the other subjects we're going to be doing. So, yeah, and with Fab Gab, um, it's not religiously every Sunday. I mean, it's been a few weeks that we skipped. There's really no set day. We've been doing them Sundays live, but uh, and that's on YouTube, but uh, on my channel. But it, there's no definite time. It can be any day, any time. We just work it out. Mm -hmm. and I let and people know in advance on my channel when it, the next show is. Yeah, and you, you also told me that you'll be ranking the tracks on solo albums, too. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to do the solo albums, and that's why it's going to take years, probably, to get <laughs> to get through that. And those are going to be the the more interesting ones, I think. You know, personally, I mean, I'm partial right these days to the solo material. This is why I love doing talk more talk because mm-hmm. we talk about solo stuff uh, mostly. Uh, and yeah, it, the solo albums are more fun, I think, to approach. Yeah, you know, and it's also refreshing. Songs. It's refreshing with all the podcasts and YouTube channels to have people discussing the solo music because for yeah. a lot of people, it's been largely ignored on the radio with the exception of certain classic tracks and classic albums. And that's it. So, Correct. yeah. Uh, yeah. It's very refreshing to hear any conversation. And with the Beatles, you can go in a million different directions. And uh, mm-hmm. I'm sure that you and I are going to be doing you know, the same thing, (laughs) exploring so many different options of what to do. I know I just recently, I started something new called the number nine dream show, and we're going to continue doing that as well as this new idea that I just started, which is called the fab five. And uh, Joe has been gracious enough to be the first victim for this show (laughs) uh, in which what I will do is ask my guest to name a total of five albums, one from the Beatles, one each from the solo Beatles. And these are your go-to albums for today. This is the album that you feel like listening to the most from each of the Beatles individually and the Beatles as a group. Now, by no means do not confuse this with what you consider their best album or your favorite album. It could be something completely different or it could go hand in hand. It could be one and the same. The way that I look at it is this. Here's a scenario. You're going on vacation. You're packing the car. You're in a hurry. You don't have time to think. You're running to your CD shelves, like what you have behind you there, Joe, or what I have behind here. And uh, (laughs) you say, oh, I want to bring one McCartney album. Don't have time to think. What are you going to go for? What are you going to reach for? These are the albums that you want to hear the most from each of them individually and as a group. The only thing I ask for when you come up with this list is number one, um, no greatest hits or compilations. They don't really count as far as I'm concerned. Um, And also when it concerns a new release like McCartney 3 or the Plastic Auto Band box set, if those are your choices, they're because they are the albums you want to listen to, not just because it's the newest release or because you want to get more acquainted with McCartney 3, okay? Even though it's been out now almost five months. We're doing this now in May of 2021. And as you all know, taste can change. If I was to interview Joe a year from now, this could be a completely different list. But it's just to get into his mindset, to know what he's listening to now, and more importantly, to find out why these are the albums he's listening to the most now. So I'm going to shuffle it all up and I'm going to start with George Harrison for you. Oh, okay. I didn't, (laughs) I was wondering what order we were going to go in. Um, Come on. I had these all together here. I wanted to (laughs) also show them as I go. George Harrison. um, And the way I did this, Ken, I I, I should should tell you and everybody watching is that I kind of considered, like you said, go to album in the sense that when I'm in the car, because I have a CD player in my car, mm-hmm. and uh, I'll always do just what you said. I'll go over there, and it'll be like, okay, I, and which ones do I grab the most and want to hear for whatever reason? George Harrison is probably not very uh, surprising out of the ones I picked here. Uh, this is probably the least surprising to many people. I went with Cloud Nine. Okay. Of all the George Harrison albums I find, this is the one that I gravitate towards the most. And uh, really quick, you want to hear George, uh, you know, I usually grab this one. Um, and it is one of my favorites, it happens to be of George, it's probably my, my second best uh, it, behind all things must pass. But uh, I, I think because it's so accessible, so commercial, it's got so much good stuff on here. I, I use the word comeback for George, a comeback album. Of course, George would have been the first one to tell you I haven't gone anywhere. You know, I, mm-hmm, I never went anywhere. It just wasn't out in the clubs or anything, whatever, that kind of thing. But, you know, it was it was a kind of a shot in the arm working with Jeff Lynn. I love the production. A lot of people I talk to 
on my channel like Jeff Lynn. Some don't. Some of them don't like his production. Me, I think he saved George's career in, in a lot of ways. I think the songs on Cloud Nine are there. I mean, the songs right. are just very good. All the way, it's consistent all the way through. I like that about it. But I think it gives that extra oomph that maybe George uh, needed at this time. Uh, and I think his voice never was better. I think he really uh, sang very well on these. And uh, I don't know if he was making that extra effort or just maybe wasn't so concerned about it that it just flowed naturally. But well, yeah, it's a consistent album. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, he did say, because uh, people had commented to him that you're singing so much better now. And he said the reason for that is because he doesn't worry about it too much, or at least at that not time, worried. he not wasn't worrying. worrying about it. <laughs> so he yeah. just went for it. Yeah. And you can yeah, sense that uh, and in, I, in, in songs like Wreck of the Hesperus, for example, his voice is great. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at the, this, the track listing. Yeah, solid all the way through, as I said. Uh, very accessible. You know, um, for just about anybody, I would think. And I'm um, just so glad that George uh, had a hit, you know, a, and a number one with Got My Mind Set on You, which, mm -hmm. of course, is, I think, the what, the last solo Beatle to have a number one that's right. song. And uh, that's, US. I mean, that's not even, not even my favorite track on the album, but... You know, I do love it. So, yeah, that's why I, I go with Cloud Nine. It's always my go to. I'm glad to hear you say what you said about Jeff Lynn, because I've always defended Jeff Lynn where the Beatles are concerned. And you look at, you know, how his production benefited, you know, Tom Petty as well and Roy Orbison. And um, yeah, and I, I do believe that as much as I love George's production on previous albums, and I think the remastering that's been done on all the Dark Horse stuff from 33 and a third through Gontrapo sounds fantastic production wise. At the time, uh, Jeff Lynn's production did give it more oomph, made it sound more modern. And I think if George's production sounded more like Gontrapo or somewhere in England, it may not have done as well. So I think the production Agreed. really did help this album although i've said many times i'm a song man the song counts first but the material was was definitely there so you you prefer george when he's more commercial and not as serious and the spiritual side of him no no that that's not well, no it's not like that at all i just mean uh if i was just going to let's just say just jump on a nice day into the car maybe just drive somewhere that would be the album that i go for most but I know you're very fond, for example, of living in the material world, and so sure. am I. Um, it's an album that I came to love later in life, uh, you know, uh, maybe because I got a little more spiritual. I, I just think it, it says more to me. Uh, and that's, you know, a more laid back experience, I think, you know, mm -hmm. uh, more you know under underplayed kind of thing but yeah i love that album as well you know um I, i'm generally i mean i as anybody who watches my channel knows i mean i take no shame in saying i i, I am a mainstream kind of guy i mean i like odd stuff too but i tend to go for hits i love uh, growing up uh, in the new york area with wabc in the 70s and top 40 and all that <laughs> 70s stuff you're speaking so, my language joe i mean i grew yeah, up on ABC. yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, every song was great. I mean, uh, in the top 40 then, uh, you know, and part of it may, may have been your youth and nostalgia, but uh, that, not always. It was just good <laughs> good stuff. If you liked everything you were hearing, or every, every, every third song, maybe not as much, but most of them, yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's the music then. It's not just like, oh, you know, I'm nine years old, 10 years old, 11 years old. That's why I'm digging it. <clears throat> Although it helps to be like eight or nine if you like chick a boom or <laughs> so I do like that. <laughs> yeah. Don't you just love it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stuff like, you know what I mean? It's, it helps. I mean, what a great time. I mean, to like brand new key by Melanie or something sure. like that. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, I think it had, had I been 25 or something, maybe I'd be like more, ah, what is this? But getting a brand new pair of roller skates at nine years old or something. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm you going know, on a tangent, but you, you know okay. what I mean. But 
you know, we're very much alike there because my favorite memories of radio, and I have a lot of them, are of Top 40 Radio growing up in New York, and WABC was the king. And I Mm -hmm. love Top 40 in the 60s and and the 70s, too. I still followed Top 40 in in, in the 80s. But my favorite period is that early 70s when it comes to Top 40, like Melody, you know, all the stuff, you know, know, Gilbert O'Sullivan, you know, all the the, you know, the hits of, say, 70 through 75, you know, that's Mm -hmm. that's That's uh, yeah. Get Down by Gilbert O'Sullivan. <laughs> there you go. We could do a show just on this, just reminiscing oh, and feeling good. Definitely, definitely. Top 40 was a big influence on me because like the Beatles, I was exposed to so many different styles of music and it was all played, whether it was country, whether it was bubblegum, whether it was rock, whether it was progressive rock. You know, you could hear the Osmonds, Led Zeppelin, uh, yeah. you know, the solo Beatles, Stevie Wonder, uh, you know, country music, Charlie Rich, you know, all on the same channel. And that's what I loved about it. So between that and the Beatles, you know, and you could be hearing like, yeah, it's too late by Carol King. And then the next minute you're hearing take me home country roads by John Denver or something like that. I mean, a lot, a lot of variety too. That that's, that's what it, another thing that's not all the same today, you know, it's a lot of whatever I do, have the misfortune to hear. I know I'm gonna, it's a lot of like, I don't know, robotic tech, tech, though, all the same manufactured kind of thing. Mm. That's why I like. The yeah, past well, yes, that's that's a whole other conversation. But anyway, yes. uh, so cloud nine is what does it for you right now at this moment. Right now. Yeah. For George Harrison. Why don't we do uh, John next? Yeah, John is, is the easiest. You know, it's, we always seem to have to say, unfortunately, it's so sad that we don't have a lot of John stuff. Um, now, when it comes to John, without a doubt, this is what I reach for the most. Um, before I show it and talk about it, I'll say, you know, I may say that Plastic Ono Band is John's masterpiece and, you know, that kind of thing, uh, where he said such deep stuff and everything but as we, as we talked about on a recent episode of talk more talk you have to be in a certain mood really uh it's mm. not as accessible um the imagine album is right up there for me but i think for me that one's a little played out for me it's uh, you know right now mm. so i don't grab imagine as much the one that i go for a lot is walls and bridges Okay. Walls and bridges is that's the one that I seem to do. All right, let's go. I'm off. Uh, where's the John section? All right, let's go. Let's grab my walls and bridges. Um, and what can I say about it? You know, one thing I'd like to discuss is, and I have to preface it by saying, I'm always a fan of Yoko Ono. Uh, I don't love everything she did, but I, I, I like a lot of stuff, especially. The, the singing stuff, not so much just screaming. I don't mind when it's done modestly at, and it fits, like uh, Kiss, Kiss, Kiss at the end, or I'm Moving On, a little bit of that. Uh-huh. Or even We're All Water, which is just a tour de force. It's a lot of <laughs> a lot of fun. But I mention her because I, I feel I have to say this, that if I was anybody else, they would say, oh, you're putting Yoko down by what I'm about to say, and I'm not. Even I like Walls and Bridges because it's one time where John was kind of by himself. I feel like this is just John Lennon doing a John Lennon album, really. Where the other ones, you know, you have Yoko's influence a lot kind of in there. Not as much on this one, even though a song like Bless You obviously Mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, pining for Yoko and stuff. And that's fine. And as hey. That's why I wanted to make it clear that I, I'm fine with all that and I defend all that and stick up for John all the time, countless times, saying, look, you know, the man loved her and I get it and that's fine. But even it's, it's nice walls and bridges once in a while. Like if John had maybe hadn't met Yoko and had been by himself, here's maybe just a, an album again that, uh, uh, you know, he's doing on his own kind of. And uh, it's funny, it seems like I'm going to say the same thing sort of I said about Cloud Nine. It's the commercial album, it's an accessible album. Uh-huh. Uh, it's just a regular kind of record. I mean, I, I could go down the tracks, but we, that take too long. But uh, and I love 
just about everything on here again, um, with the exception maybe of Yaya at the end with the that's tagged Julian. on. But that's just for yeah. fun. With yeah. Ju- Julian on drums, you know, that's uh-huh. not that's a fun little thing to have at the end. But uh, Steel and Glass has has always been one of my favorites. Which is John called Son of How Do You Sleep. It's kind of like sure. a sequel in a way to that. Um, and whatever gets you through the night is John's only number one while he was alive. And that just, ha- it's not one of my favorite John Lennon songs, whatever gets you through the, through the night. It's never been one, but it, when I'm listening to the, to the, these, this record, this album, mm-hmm. and that comes on, I always feel good though, that I know, oh, there's, there's John's like commercial hit that he got to, to see while he was alive. And it surprised even him that when it became it, number one. When it was a hit. Did you like it then? Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I don't recall, even though I'm old enough, I mm. don't recall that one. Uh, I remember like Uncle Albert, even earlier stuff by Paul, you know, Uncle Albert being when it was a hit and playing mm. on ABC all the time. Uh, and some other ones too, like all the Ringo things, Oh My My and uh, You're 16 and but Don't Come Easy and so on. Right. Uh, why, why I don't recall hearing whatever gets you through the night on the radio i don't know because i was listening to the radio all the time i don't know why i don't remember it just doesn't sink in here Hmm. but um i don't dislike it it's just it's just not a favorite but yeah i think it's that again a feeling this is john kind of making an an album that's just a i don't know a regular guy's album kind of in a way i don't know it's like it's and and it's, it's not so much that he's Doing politics, uh, like on sometime in New York City, or and, or give me some truth on Imagine, or he's just completely soul searching and casting out his demons like he did on Plastic Ono Band. Right. Although there's some of that here too, with Scared and and so on, sure. where he's kind of like talking about you know, what bothers him and going down on love. Yeah, I think again, I'd use the word more accessible, more general stuff on here. Yeah, well, I think that it's true. Yes, John physically was away from Yoko, but Yoko was always an influence anyway. And I think the, the yeah, biggest yeah. influence, well, well, I shouldn't say the big, one of the biggest influences is that John's music became more personal. He really spoke his mind a lot. And it didn't really matter whether Yoko was in the room or not, because like you said, a song like Bless You or Going Down on Love, a deeply personal songs talking about his mm-hmm. relationship with her. So mm-hmm. she was still there in his mind and mm-hmm. she's always been an influence, you know, from from the time they met. But, yeah, I can understand that this was John on his own. You know, and uh, Yoko wasn't in the studio with him, like during Plastic Ono Band or Imagine sometime in new york city uh yeah i understand what you mean about that and definitely um stealing glass uh, i agree with you there terrific terrific oh john's vocals they're soaring in that when he's holding that long note <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> you know? right yeah. it's amazing yeah. and uh, i love the strings on there and the horns yeah and I, I miss the horns uh you know give me some truth was such a great compilation that was yeah. put together but i really the only real criticism i have of that wonderful release overall is that the horns missing they were taken out for that mm. particular mastering yeah. re- remixing mixing what was the remixing. reason what was the reason sean gave for that do you remember oh uh i don't know if it was a hundred percent his his thoughts or not i don't really I'm not sure of that. Okay. But I, I always felt that, that John used horns really well <laughs> on his recordings, like on Steel and Glass, like on What You Got, you know, you know, make yeah, such yeah. a funky track and, uh, you know, stuff like uh, Cleanup Time, for example. Yeah. I'm a fan. I'm a fan of, of horns, on, uh, you know, uh, that's another thing I find, you know, we all have different tastes. Some people don't like that. They don't like brass or stuff in their, in their rock music, pop music. Mm. I've heard that from time to time. Me, I, I, I like it. I do. Big Chicago fan. <laughs> <laughs> a good example. Yeah. That's a good example. Okay. Why don't we stick the Beatles right in the middle? <laughs> you know what's interesting? <laughs> this is, is fascinating to me because just by coincidence, 
the first three that we're doing are the only times where I, I had one easy, I had one album. Uh, when it comes to Paul and Ringo, I have more than one, but I'll get to, to that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with one, but I'm okay. going to kind of play. Beatles, you would think, well, the Beatles, you must have like 13 or something like that, right? Mm. Um, yeah, the, well, the one, I, this has been for the longest time, the one that I gravitate to the most. I love all the Beatles stuff. It's always something you have to say, right? Yeah. Well, everybody, I love all the Beatles. Don't, don't attack me or anything, you know. Don't throw rocks. Um, and that goes from the early stuff, the middle stuff, the latest stuff. But I think my favorite era is, is early Beatles, if, you know. So, again, uh, when it comes to just grabbing something and going and listening to music, I tend to want to go for the more raw, early, primitive, upbeat stuff. And this is an unpopular opinion in many people's eyes, I think, for Beatles. It's with the Beatles. This is the most played Beatles album by me of the UK. If it was, if it were talking uh, the US, it would be the Beatles' second album. That's my all time favorite Beatles album. A lot of people know that about me. That's my favorite Beatles album of any kind. If you want to just say anything goes, it's a Beatles' second album. Uh, but it's funny too because there's a lot of stuff here from Beatles' second album, but there's also stuff on here that was on the Meet the Beatles. Sure. Capital. Uh, so all that whole thing, you know, Meet the Beatles, Beatles' second album with the Beatles. Uh, why is it that I picked this? Well, as I say, early energy. The Beatles are even more seasoned, than, even a little bit than they were for Please Please Me. They're getting even better, mm -hmm. um, and I think that they just have that hungry primal energy to it it's, it's like a heavily driven album and everything here just like effortlessly appeals it just goes all the way through the 14 tracks from it won't be long opening up with the yeah yeah of it won't be long mm -hmm. all the way to what i think maybe my favorite cover song done by the beatles money that's what i want mm -hmm. toss up between tw twist and shout or money but uh, twist and shouts again of it you know done to death in a way right. but money with the way John uh, screams that you could and you could believe that he wants that money more than anything else <laughs> <laughs> by every everything he, he goes he screams to his vocal cords. It's 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 just it's wonderful. Every George shines on here on Roll Over Beethoven. I love Ringo and I Want to Be Your Man, but mm -hmm. I did also love him on the song Boys. So there you go. Uh, I just I just love it. All my loving. I always say the number one single that should have been really. It <laughs> should have been nice if they mm -hmm. put that out as, as a single. Um, Don't Bother Me. Yeah, I mentioned George. Uh, you know, George uh, put the song down because it was his first song. And I can understand that from an artist standpoint. You know, you're, you're the artist and you're closer to it. You're like, well, I just, it's not one of my best songs. I just something I wrote. I love it. I love it's it. It's got a real haunting feel to it and it's uh, moody. I, 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 I I really adore that song. And all I've got to do, you know, uh, like with John. Yeah, well, I could say this about any Beatle album, go down every track and say why I love every track. That's, that's not so much what, you know, qualifies it as being the one I pick, right? Because mm. if, if it's because you love every track, that's every Beatle album, you know? That's true. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I just go for this more. I don't know. It's just fun, uh, exciting still. After all these decades, it's exciting. It's like something to do here. Beatlemania was just starting to really take hold before they got to the States, but it was in England. And, uh, yeah, I get that feeling every time. It seems so fresh to me, even though it's as old as it is. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I mean, you're going to get so many different opinions from Beatle fans. And I often question, as I have done on various podcasts and recently on Things We Said Today, why the later Beatles stuff is what always charts and the early Beatles stuff does not. And some people think that early Beatles music sounds dated. And, you know, I could understand some of it in this day and age may sound that way. Yeah. But at the same time, I love the innocence of that time. And even in their early albums, there was innovation, you know, and you could see once you look at the British albums in particular, even going from, as you said, from Please Please Me to With the Beatles, there's a progression there. You know, there was an advancement in the songwriting. It was a little bit more complex. And it's always funny. I mean, 
you talked about George Harrison and his comments about don't bother me. You should never expect the artist himself to feel the same way that the fans do. They can right. be far more sensitive to their own work. Um, yeah. And uh, the fact that this was his first, you know, complete composition by himself. But what I love about Don't Bother Me is that even early on, you could tell that George's compositions were different from Lennon and McCartney's. He had his own style, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, so it, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Don't bother me. And in a good way. And yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. It is different from everything else. On I don't know if it's just the, the arrangement too. If that has something to do with it, you know, um, mm. the, the sounds that they have on there are a little different. But uh, yeah, but no, it's it's different, and it's also kind of uh, I don't know uh, the negative negativity of it. You know, I got no time for you right now. Don't bother me. You know, kind mm. of thing. That's that's interesting. There's a lot of that in George's music. That's just who he yeah. is, you know? And, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, you, you, you talked about, uh, you know, songs that could have been singles, and definitely All My Loving is one of them. Yeah. Uh, but um, it won't be long, could have worked, well, as far as I'm it concerned. It won't be long, sure, sure. You know, I love Not a Second Time on here again. It's uh -huh. you know, I love that. It's one of my favorite John Beatles songs of all. Again, it has a dark feel to it, and it... You know, it's not it's not just like, you know, la, 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 let's sing for me to you or something. I'm trying to think of a good example, comparison, yeah. you know, but uh, no, that's a little bit more of me to it. Yeah. You know, that's um, uh, I agree with everything you said there. Not a second time is a favorite for me. I think for Al Sussman when he was when I just interviewed him as well. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. But um, probably uh, in, in addition to the music being great, you probably feel a little bit nostalgic in the fact that you were brought up on the American albums and Meet the Beatles mm -hmm. and the Beatles' second album are probably near and dear to you. And for mm -hmm. me, Meet the Beatles was my first Beatles album. So there'll always be some attachment there. And if you combine the two and you got the songs on with the Beatles from there, you can understand why, you know, that's an added plus. Yeah, and it's it's always strange to me that when uh, a lot of times when fans on social media, you know, ranking their Beatle albums with the Beatles always goes near the bottom. I mean, with Beatles for sale tends to like get less. Uh, or, and I think that's because in their minds, the covers, I think they think, well, there's more covers on here. Mm -hmm. than, uh, I mean, that's the, the rationale. But, you know, it's all subjective. Whatever it is a person likes or better than others is their, their own reasoning. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, I just love the excitement and energy of it. I, a lot of times, I you know, I think the Beatles, uh, when it comes to the cover songs they, they, they did, were sometimes better than the originals and or a lot of times just as good, uh, just as good, if not better than the originals. And that, yeah, I'm biased because I'm a big Beatles fan, but yep. I think so. I mean, as much as I love like Buddy Holly, I think like the Beatles words of love even better than Buddy Holly's, for example. Um, the it's harmonies nice have, on that. Yeah, the three-part harmony makes a big difference. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, all right. That is a great uh, great choice right there. And so let's move on and do Ringo next. Somehow I thought Paul would, would, would be safe for last. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so much yeah. stuff. He's got to yeah, be the, the most difficult, you know. You've got over well, 30 That's what I'm albums. saying. Yeah. All right, this is now, you see... I wonder how I'm going to play this because I'm realizing there's a pattern here, but uh, I don't want to sound too redundant. But the way I'm going to say this, just to, to show you, of course, I, I have a few runner, runners up for this one. I, I, of course, I have the Ringo album. Mm -hmm. I, I'll go for the Ringo album. It's enough said. I mean, you know, uh, it's a classic album, probably his best album. Uh, but I tend to grab this, but I'm not going to put it to number one because it's not the one I listen to the most. I grab this a lot, too. Stop mm. and Smell the Roses. Now, this uh, saves me in that sense, and it's a little more unusual. You know uh -huh. what I mean? Uh, you know, I, I'll grab, I, I don't know why Ringo, I seem to have more different albums that I grab than the other three. So, Stop and Smell the Roses. But the one that I, I went to, um, again, this is kind of following Cloud Nine and so on, is... Mm -hmm. Time takes time. <laughs> Nothing wrong I, with that. Much like uh, Cloud Nine, I would call 
this one, Ringo's second best album, in my opinion, uh, after the Ringo album. Uh, and I, I always urge people to listen to this, fans, you know, especially fans who kind of underrate Ringo or don't think that he's worth their, their time as much as Paul or John, George. Um, you know, I don't have to have Ringo or any of the Beatles sound like the Beatles in order to enjoy it, you know. But if if that's your thing and you need the Beatle feeling too, a lot of Beatlesque songs on here, Beatles sounding Definitely. songs on here with Jellyfish, mm-hmm. uh, and the way it's produced here again, uh, Don Peter Asher, Don Was, uh, Jeff Lynn, Phil Ramone, mm-hmm. uh, Weight of the World. Look, we could go forever on a show with this, which hopefully we will do. Why the heck wasn't that a big hit single? You know, uh, because it's not about. I know why, because I'm answering my own question. It's not about the quality of the songs. The so- song quality is there. It's just the radio, and Ringo was kind of written off by people still at that time, I think. You know, and uh, it's just, this album, folks, is a consistent album. Another one, great all the way through. It's Ringo, definitely, I, I'm safe in, in calling it a comeback album. Mm-hmm. It's Ringo's comeback album, and it didn't chart on Billboard, anyway, it didn't even yes. make the top 200. It's just, it's just since albums since then have made, even made the charts, even in the 100s or lower. Yeah. Oh, uh, I don't know what I could say. It, it's commercial. There you go. There's that word again. Maybe that's why the ones. I mean, if I'm listening at home, I'm just going to listen and relax, lie down, and listen. I can listen to almost anything when I'm out and about. I want to hear something more zippy, commercial, mm. fun. Makes you feel good. This album's all those things. Zippy, commercial, fun, makes you feel good. Uh, upbeat for the most part. I mean, really happy. Um, you know, I can't say enough about Time Takes Time. And I, I regret so much, for Ringo's sake, that uh, it wasn't, I won't say a hit, but it should have made the charts. And, you know, it didn't. May I echo those words, Joe? but you've heard me say similar things and and without belaboring the point about radio which has been the primary vehicle for all this music to be heard for out for most of our lifetime um you know as artists get older uh the people who program radio stations feel that their audience is older and once you reach a certain age which is like 54 in radio, they don't care about you anymore and they don't play the new music of the new artists. And you could say that about almost every veteran artist that's out there. They might get just a little bit of airplay just out of respect and that's about it. And we're talking- Would you say that was the case, excuse me, even in 92, would you say that was, I mean, mean, the case? I know today it certainly is. You know, I mean, Paul was still getting some airplay he was getting more airplay with MTV and VH1, but that's not as important, believe it or not. That's not as important overall to being heard on a couple hundred radio stations that play the hits on the top 40 stations. That is a stronger influence by far, you know, and we, we've talked on Talk More Talk and even on my other podcast, things we said today, certain songs like Way to the World or, or The World Tonight, you know, why on earth those songs weren't big hits? And it's all because of radio, you know, and the people who program it, they have a lot of control over that stuff. And if young people aren't exposed to that music and they make up the bulk of the sales, then the records aren't going to go anywhere. Or if they do, like in the case of most of McCartney's albums that chart very high or they debut very high, that's because all the hardcore fans rush out and buy it initially and it debuts at number two or number one in the case of Egypt Station and McCartney 3, but then it dies a quick death because there's no yeah. there's no place where it's played to young people. So if the mm-hmm. only audience you have are the old fans that grew up with you and they know about the new releases and they buy it quickly, then it has no longevity. It has no legs. And in the case of Ringo, this is something I I wish we would discuss on Talk More Talk, and we have talked about this. His his sales plummeted right after Goodnight Vienna. I mean, yes, his, right. his, his albums charted after Goodnight Vienna, but they didn't do that well. And I don't know why so quickly there was this tremendous change. He had seven top 10 singles 
between 1971 mm -hmm. and 75 mm -hmm. from It Don't Come Easy through the No-No song. And then it took a dive right after that. And I kind of feel like, you know, a lot of people never took Ringo that seriously to begin yeah, with. Yeah, that's kind part of, like, of it. Yeah. He, he's the Rodney Dangerfield of rock. And a lot of people <laughs> no think, respect. yeah, that, uh, you know, he's lucky that he was at the Beatles and blah, blah, blah. And you've heard people say that from time to time. Oh, well, whenever they say Ringo was lucky, I mean, look, he was lucky to get the gig, sure. But at the time, they were just as lucky to get him, if not luckier. That's true. Um, Ringo was a, a, a big drummer back then and uh, in demand. And I remember a, qu a quote from John where he said, Ringo was a professional. We were amateurs. You know, mm -hmm. that's what he said, I quote. So this, you know, that whole thing, I hear that all the time. Ringo was the luckiest man in show business. Well, right. the Beatles really clicked when they got Ringo more than ever. I mean, you know. It worked both ways. The Beatles are lucky to have him. You know, yeah. it's all pieces of the puzzle coming together. Well, one thing I wanted to touch on as you were talking was about I got my mind set on you by George in mm. 87. That still managed to be a number one. And and, and it, it fascinates me in a way because I mean, there was the MTV videos. They had a couple, two videos, one of him in the den and the other one uh, with the the young guy trying to win a girl a toy in, 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 right. in a vending, uh, a vending, what is it, an arcade, arcade machine. Yeah. And I thought that one in particular probably – appeal to a lot of kids watching MTV at the time. But the song itself, it's a cover song of an old, uh, uh, you know, an old song to begin with. And yet it, 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 I'm glad it was a hit. I'm just I'm amazed how that was able to do it. You know, mm -hmm. we're still talking five years earlier. I know, know. you know, but, there, uh, there are times and I don't even think it applies that much now when if you take a break from the recording industry, like John did for his five years, then all of a sudden there's renewed interest more interest mm -hmm. than there would be if you put in an album every year or once every two years. So I think that benefited George to some degree and it also helped that Jeff Lynne produced it. And that and was I, a yeah. damn catchy song, but yeah, you know, why, why George and not Ringo? That's hard to yeah, say. So I was gonna say, I, I remember George also, all these quotes from interviews I remember, I remember him jokingly saying, well, I think absence makes the heart grow fonder when it comes to like, why you, had you, you got such a hit album here. You know? Yeah, and He said that too. Uh, before we move on, I want to mention uh, this is up and coming for Ringo as one that I'm playing a lot in the car. It's okay. What's My Name. Mm -hmm. I love this album. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because my number one choice was Time Takes Time. But this is my third favorite Ringo album on the, uh, right now. Um, and it's, it's rare that a, that a newer album, more and more recent by anybody of any of the Beatles, would be in your top three, four, five, but this one is say, a lot of the same reasons. I think this is just a, a fun, happy, exciting kind of up, up, upbeat overall album. Mm -hmm. So I enjoy it. I know that all a you lot. guys on Talk More Talk have raved about What's My Name. I'm glad yeah. to see you get that respect. But um, going back to Time Takes Time, yeah, this was an album that, in my opinion, because Ringo, for some reason and this change with Mark Hudson, he had this, this mindset of every album is 10 tracks, five songs, side one, five songs, side two. And I kind of felt like every single song that was chosen for time takes time was wisely chosen. This was the best of the material that he was handed and they all work really well. I mean, you talk about weight of the world uh, in a heartbeat <laughs> is a song that, you know, if it was the 70s, especially in that first five years of the 70s, if Ringo had released that as a single, my God, that's so Beatles and Beach Boys mixed together. Yeah. It's yeah. got a, a don't worry baby feel to it. And, uh, you know, every song on there has commercial appeal. Yeah, and you could say that about a lot of the songs. If only it had been in the seventies, or because it, it's true, and that includes "Weight of the World." I think uh, I love "Don't Go Where the Road Don't Go" also on here mm. because he's he's talking about his battles, I guess, that he's had over the, the years with alcohol and stuff, and he's trying to, you know, get on track. I, I love that, but there's so many songs in here. All in the name of love. Uh, after all these years, I don't believe you. In a heartbeat, yeah. Golden Blunders. Well, that's in, Golden Blunders. Is, why don't, is that a... That's a posy oh, put myself. Song. There you go. See, I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I was right. <laughs> like, yeah. I didn't know who it was, but it wasn't. It was a song by somebody else. 
Yeah, Peter Asher. Yeah, that's that's another thing about this album. Well, I would say this about everybody except Jeff Lynn, but I can't tell the difference between a Peter Asher production and a Phil Ramone production and Don Was production. Jeff Lynn kind of sticks out a little bit. Yeah, but um, the others really had a consistent sound throughout. And it was really produced extremely well. I don't believe you for anyone that really wants Ringo to sound like the Beatles. <laughs> I don't believe you was like 1965 Ringo. That's like what goes on. What goes on? <laughs> yeah, it really part. is. If you think that about part, it. yeah, well, yeah. the main chorus, uh, chorus. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Yeah. All right, very good. Um, definitely, I, I I agree there with Joe. If you've never listened to Time Takes Time, please do so. It's a solid album, all ten tracks. Um, and so, our final selection is from Mr. McCartney. Okay, well, I have 17 here, albums here. <laughs> no, 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 I don't. It's so, uh, no, but I say it's hard, but no, because I'm not picking favorites here. Right. I'm picking what I, what I tend to listen to the most. Now, there are four albums that I, that I pretty equal to the amount of times I gravitate towards listening to a Paul album. So I'll show you the one up, and I'll, uh, for number one that I'll stick with, I'll put it at the end. Of course, let's get this out of the way right now. <laughs> 50th anniversary. Here it comes. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, get ready. Here it comes. You know, <laughs> you know, Ram. You know, hey, happy 50th. But I feel like we're we're talking about this so much. You know, that I, I have nothing else to say about it. You know, it's a great. It's my favorite Paul album. It's my number one Paul album. But that's not the one that I I think the most I pull to listen to. Another one is that I quite a lot is Venus and Mars. Hmm. Um, okay. I. You know, it's close to Band on the Run, but I don't know. I just, for me, it's not as, I say, I hate the term played out, but that's all I could come up with. You know, I, I'm so I, I'm so used to Band on the Run, more even more. Venus mm. and Mars, I usually pull out more than Band on the Run. And here's a surprising one. Fairly recent. New. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I just think this is, especially on a beautiful sunny day like today, maybe, maybe I'll play this when I finish the show and go out um yeah i i love it i i, I love it it's new it's it, notice there's a theme here with me when it comes to which one i'm going to pick as i say it has to do with i'm talking specifically for getting outdoors that, that that's not a criteria for this exercise mm. it could be one you pull to listen to inside mm -hmm. the house right but i'm right. but i'm looking at it that way which one when i'm out and i get grab my cd for the car um yeah this is just so uplifting and fresh and new and new you know, like a lot of us thought, why is he calling this new when it's not a new album anymore? Well, it's not about that it's a new album. It's mm. about newness <laughs> <laughs> when something's new and exciting. Right. So uh, that's how I look at it. All right. So now let's go. This is definitely the one I, the last one I'm going to show you is the one, my number one that I picked the most without question. And it's going to like throw some people back a little bit. Okay. Ooh, back to the egg. <laughs> yeah, Very that, interesting. Finally, it's not all, all the most commercial, <laughs> typical ones for me, right? Okay. Why now? Um, I was 17 when this came out. It, I think it's the first Paul album, you know, with Paul that I bought when it was new, that I went to the store with my own money to buy. So there's a little nostalgia factor in the times. But I've always liked the fact that this was Paul with wings, I should say, and, uh, you know, wings, um, rock it out more. And Paul trying to, I don't know, he says punk, but I don't know if every, if there's that much punk on him than spin it on. You could loosely call it punk. Maybe uh, Old Siam, sir. Old Siam, sir, which is my favorite track on the album, Old Siam, sir, by the way. I would say to you has an element of, of punk to it and rawness. Yeah. Um, as much, you know, again, I, I'm not going to criticize too much, but it, it, I, I like the whole album start to finish. Although I love Baby's Request and I love After the Ball, stuff like that. Mm. Doesn't, they don't seem to fit here to me as well, the style of like, of all heavy, raunchy stuff. Uh, but I mean, I love them. But yeah, I think also because the fact that I was 17, it reminds me of those times, you know, uh, 1979. Mm. And uh, I do like the music. It's not just for nostalgia. But 
I think it's also that again, it's not something that you hear all the time. You know, these the, there weren't really any big singles on here. Am I right? I mean, uh, well, they didn't really closer. do that much. Getting closer uh, went to number twenty in the United States. Oh, I don't get that high. And huh. uh, Arrow Through Me, I believe, went to twenty nine. Yeah, and at, at the time, you're talking about also seeing those videos. There was that show, Back to the Egg, on TV mm-hmm. that showed you the, the promo films, videos, whatnot, right. for so many of the songs, which I'm hoping we get an archive of this because I want to see those and everything. Uh, and I love Denny Lane's again and again and again. Mm-hmm. It's one of my favorite Denny Lane songs on here. But I think this might be my favorite lineup of Wings. You know, I love uh, Steve Holly and Lawrence Juber. You okay. know, uh, I mean, not to take anything away from uh, Joe English or, uh, well, I don't know. It's hard to say because I also love Jimmy McCulloch. So I really, I really don't know <laughs> Jimmy <laughs> on, you know, on Junior's Farm and stuff. It's so, geez, it's so hard. And Venus and Mars. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's that it's it, it's more fresh to me in the sense that it's not played to death. Even though I'm playing it to death. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Does that make any sense? It's not band on the run, you know. I can again, relate. You, you know, know, jet again, because yeah, there's so many great songs, but boy, you know, especially the way back to radio, the way some of the commercial radio stations around here are doing it. You hear, how did that ever happen? We got to talk about that one day uh, off camera. How did it ever happen where there's like the you play the same fifteen twenty songs? rotation if you're listening one morning at, at work say at, at at nine o'clock in the morning you'll hear these same 10 15 songs then maybe if you listen at night the next day they play them then but it's the same rotation of mm, classic oldies and uh, well we we can get into that on on talk more talk or even just very briefly i can tell you a lot of testing is done in the business as to what songs work well what people want to hear and certainly in the case of you know, classic rock radio, a lot of stations will only play the same 300 songs or 500 songs with no variation. So I could, I can automatically tell you on classic rock that when it comes to McCartney, you're only going to hear band on the run. Maybe I'm amazed jet live and let die. That's yeah. Basically it. Maybe, maybe let me roll it. And I'm not talking yeah. about, Beatles shows on the weekend. I'm just talking about no. what you would normally hear. And it's sad because you know at one time they were playing a lot of other music, especially when it first came out. And I know exactly how you feel about um, these albums sounding fresh because uh, I'll never deny Band on the Run is a, is a great album, but there can be fatigue with certain albums that have been played out, which I think Sgt. Pepper has suffered for that reason. I think it was heralded so much and everybody heard what a great album it was and what a game changer it was and everything that, you know, people now want to turn to Revolver and, you know, and, and Rubber Soul and, and I hate to say the lesser known because they're all well known, but yeah. I'm just saying, you know, not the, the ones that are played out as much and Venus and Mars always suffered from being the follow up from Band on the Run. And a lot of people love Venus and Mars now because it sounds so fresh and you know, why on yeah. earth you still hear Band on the Run, but you don't hear Venus and Mars Rock Show on the radio? Come on, that's a crime. <laughs> and that's why that's why I picked that one, too, when I listen to that a lot more than Band on the Run. You know? Yeah. And uh, Back to the Egg has got some really, you know, edgy stuff that you, you wish Paul would, would do more often, like Spin It On and, and I Love To You and, and, um, and Old Siamser and those songs. But yeah, that's one of the ones that a lot of people feel is a very underrated McCartney Wings album. And yeah, I think you... it's getting more attention now in my experience. You know, people, people are rediscovering it. I think, you know, this is pretty good. You know, there's, there are other albums that I'm still waiting for that to, to happen. Like, for example, uh, Off the Ground. I'm waiting for people to get that album off the ground and put it up a little bit. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the great developments in in recent years are these archival box sets coming out and it's made people reassess these albums. And you're finding, as we've said with 
when McCartney 3 came out, people appreciating the DIY albums more. I think there's been more of a trend towards simpler production, not polished production, not layered as much, you know? So I think you're going to find, you know, if this trend continues, more people appreciating hopefully the whole 70s body of work of McCartney. I'd like to see it all appreciated. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, there's a similarity there. There's something to be said about the time when Paul who always had some control over the production, even when he ha has a co-producer, but it was more his production in the seventies. It was more yeah. his, you know, pure McCartney, if you will, sound. But I think a lot of people are gravitating towards that right now. And a lot of young people too, but you know, everyone's different. But, well, you know, there's, again, when it comes to solo material, there's so much out there. I love it, you know. Uh, my, my friend Anthony, uh, hey Anthony, you know, if he watches this, you know, he's all, he was just saying again the other day, oh, the Beatles could have went on longer. They should have went on at least till 78. You know, they could have went on. I'm like, just be thankful. They ended, everything was beautiful. They were on top and everything. And then we get all these wonderful solo albums. You got one path with the Beatles, which was nice. And then at the end, he blossoms out, all these other roads to explore. And that's yeah. what I love about the solo Beatles. Um, to me, it's all part of the same story from day one, from when Ringo was born, I guess. Mm. If you want to start somewhere, uh, okay. all the way till uh, we're talking now about uh, the documentary that uh, is coming out from Paul. Uh, yeah, soon. with Rick Rubin. Rick Rubin. Yeah. Uh, whatever it is, I mean, it's it's all still part of it until it's all not, <laughs> and then every, everyone's gone, and then still there'll be product coming out too, but. Well, I'm really very glad to hear you say all that you're saying because these are the words that I've been saying on the radio for almost 40 years now. And, and I didn't, I didn't plagiarize it, folks. I didn't even know that. So, <laughs> yeah, well, but we, I'm, I'm just saying that to me, it's all been one long, continuous. Oh, that part, yeah. That, I mean, I know you. Of course, I know you're a huge fan of the solo music. I know that. Yeah, but I love it all. You know, and I think that you know we got so much more music coming out of them as solo artists than we would have had had the Beatles stayed together. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people will will debate this whole thing. What if you had both at the same time? Which is very hard to coordinate, you know, mm -hmm. when you think about that. What do you do when you tour? What if the Beatles were to ever tour again? How much would be solo stuff? Would there ever be solo stuff? You know, mm -hmm. how do you mix it all together? It's not easy. You know, if you think mm -hmm. about bands like the Eagles and Genesis and how do they handle that kind of thing? You know, yeah, well, in, in retrospect, it worked out well. You know, I mean, you can't argue with the success. It, it ended well. Um, I keep saying eventually the Beatles would have, would, would have probably had to have a, a lackluster album in there at some point if they went on to like 1980 or something like that. Eventually, there have to be one that was like, uh, that's the dog of the pack. Uh, some people are, uh, you know, are very critical of the Let It Be album. But that was a disappointment. Well, with three number ones on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, fans could be super critical when it comes to yeah. the Beatles. But yeah, yeah, indeed. But I'm just so glad that, you know, we got so much great music out of them as solo artists. And I always like to point to 1970. Think about it for a second. Two albums from Ringo, one album from Paul, one album from John, a triple album from George. What more do you want? <laughs> and then you still had the Let It Be album coming out. So, yeah. you know, I wish every year was like that. But. Uh, and would the songs have been as good as Beatles songs, some of the solo ones? People often say that fans will say, oh, well, I wonder, like if uh, Instant Karma had been done as, with, by the Beatles, how would that have sounded? I don't know. Would it have sounded as good? We're used to it the way it sounds now, but would Cold Turkey really have been better with a, as a Beatles song? I don't, I, who knows? Nobody knows, but all I know is that I'm happy with the way it turned out. I'm yeah, used to it the way that it came out. Worked out, worked out good. And they yeah. went out on top. You know, we've said on Talk More Talk, I can't imagine Paul and George backing up John on the Plastic Ono Band on that material. Yeah. And I also can't imagine John and Paul backing up George on All Things Must Pass on that album. But, right. you know, I'd rather have all these songs from all these albums than one album, which you might consider the best of all of them. I mean, if every Beatles album had just two George Harrison songs and it's 1970 and All Things Must Pass came out, are you just going to pick two songs from All Things Must Pass? <laughs> 
Really? I wonder. I mean, <laughs> I'd rather have yeah. all of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, they, they were limited, especially George, especially George, yeah. the way he came out like that. And, you know, I say from 68 on, it really, it was really getting uh, floodgates were opening. I yeah. mean, how are you going to limit him to two songs, whatever it is, an album? Three, maybe. True. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been great having you here, Joe. And, uh, Thanks. We'll have you on more often. And, um, you know, we'll talk about anything you want to talk about. Maybe you might want to do a number nine dream show, whatever it is. No, oh, that'll be fun. Sure. And, of course, I'm going to have you on my Fab Gab show, future installment. So look out for that, folks. Yeah. All right. So, uh, again, to all of you, uh, please subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so already i'm going to put the link up for joe's uh channel for me mr mayo and uh of course do catch us on talk more talk a solo beatles video cast every other monday night live but even after that you can mm. hear us or watch us on demand all over the place that's all over the place yep <laughs> it's here there and everywhere that's right okay and also uh, please subscribe to the other podcast show, Things We Said Today. I know I've got fans of that show as well. Uh, YouTube channels for that, as well as Talk More Talk. So again, thanks to all of you for watching, and we'll see you next time.